Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. I'm Tanner Campbell, and this is The Path to Authenticity. checking it out if not thanks for coming back i'm tom gentry and this is the path to authenticity episode 214 part two with tanner campbell he talks about what it means to be a stoic he talks about stoicism with a lowercase s as opposed to capital s stoicism And he talks about how capital S stoicism can be good for young men who are looking for something to fill that void that they have. Anyway, here you go. Part two with Tanner Campbell. egotism, self-centeredness, that sort of thing. I think that's a Nietzsche thing, I think, is who came out with that. But I'm not into continental philosophy. That's not really my thing. Uh, I will say that a, a term like ego, I don't know that there's a direct translation for it in Greek, so they probably didn't speak to it. But what the Stoics did speak to when I talked about that assenting to a, a a valid impression or an invalid impression, although I didn't use those words at the time. What they did talk about was having a, and the reason that it was important to do that is because if you're going to move towards a virtuous character, I keep coming back to that because it's, it's, it is the central thing to the philosophy as a, as a framework for living uh, as a life philosophy. If you're going to move towards virtue, then you have to have an accurate view of the world and of yourself and of, we haven't even talked about role ethics, but we might not have time to do that. Happy to though, if we do, if you don't have an accurate view of the world, it makes it increasingly difficult to move towards virtue and increasingly easier to inadvertently perhaps, because you won't know you're doing it, move towards viciousness or vice, which is the opposite of virtue, as I said. So I think wrapped up in that idea would be an egotistical thought, like I'm the best person in the room that would be an impression that you probably (laughs) shouldn't assent to. And I have to keep saying probably because maybe you are the best person in the room. And I guess knowing that and it being true isn't a problem, but how often is that actually true? And how are we defining best? You know, I might, I might be able to say I'm the person with the lightest color hair in the room. And maybe you could assent to that pretty safely. But I think if the Stoics had a concept of, and I could be wrong, perhaps they did have a concept of something like egoism, but I haven't read it if they have, um, I, I think that they would have thought negatively about it if they had a word for it. Uh, it would have seemed like, well, that's an insane, crazy thing to think that you're the most important person in the world, right? I don't think they would have been very Ayn Randian, right? Like, I feel like they would have read Ayn Rand and been like, what is this? <laughs> this doesn't seem in line with anything we think about the world. Well, especially when you talk about basically responsibility for your fellow man you know, is what I'm, I'm hearing some measure of responsibility for your community and the human race. Yes. Yeah. Uh, then there's uh, something in stoicism called the circles of concern it has yourself in the center and then it has your family and then it has your friends and then it has your community. And then it has uh, added by Leonidas Konstantikos and Kai Whiting, I think in, tw- I want to say 2018, they added an additional circle to this, which is, so it's not, let's say it's not in the canon of stoicism, but 
uh, Leonidas and uh, Kai both believe that were the Sto- ancient Stoics alive today, they would have naturally come through science and such to learn to add that additional layer to the circles of concern. Uh, and the idea is that you bring each subsequent uh, circle or each concentric circle in another level. So you make your you t- try to think of your family as you think of yourself. You try to think of your friends as the way you think of your family. You try to think of your community the way you think of your friends, and you keep doing that until you arrive at this. And this is only something the sage can do, which the Stoics say is as rare as a phoenix. Uh, nobody's really been officially labeled a sage in Stoicism, although uh, it was true that uh, Cicero thought that Cato the Younger was one, and some people point to Diogenes as one, this Diogenes the Cynic. Uh, but there's nothing on paper that says this person was absolutely a sage. Uh, so they're very rare. But but bringing everybody into the same level of the self in those circles of concern is something that we try to do. Uh, and in Stoicism, there's a term called uh, – that is prokopton. Uh, and it essentially means – it's not strictly a Stoic word, uh, but it is something that's, that Stoics use. And it means someone who is making progress. So we are all prokoptons as students of Stoicism. We're all students. We're all making progress, and sometimes that progress isn't linear, but that's the point. Like The point isn't to become a sage, just like uh, the point in Buddhism might not, to become, might not be to become a Buddha, although I might be speaking a little out of school there because I don't know Buddhism as well as I know Stoicism. Uh, it is instead to make progress towards a virtuous character however you can. And sometimes you'll fail to make progress in a given day or a week or a month, <laughs> Uh, but that's not the, the point isn't getting there. The point is consistently trying to improve that character. And again, that, that term is prokopton. Hmm. Man, you're such an impressive guy. You really are. I love listening to all this and just going back to, um, when I asked you about ego and all that, you were talking about a responsibility or, or a, a need to see the world as it really is, right? To see reality, to be in reality. Um, one of the things I've been taught over the years is someone's definition of humility that I really like and is seeing things as they really are. So I'm not greater than anybody else. I'm not lesser than anybody else. I'm just me. And, and if you're in that mindset, you are seeing things as they really are. Right. And then the circles of concern, I saw that post that you did and the, uh, the illustration of it. And it, it's so funny because just the day before I'd been working on uh, an exercise or, or, uh, a visualization of an exercise that I do with people um, that looks practically the same is labeled practically the same, but it's a, it's, it's a way to visualize your emotional boundaries. And at the center is the self and the next level out is sort of it. And it's about how you manage access to yourself, how you manage information about yourself, who you let in, who you don't. And, uh, it, that, that's immediately what I thought of when I saw that. But, uh, obviously the, the circles of concern, it was kind of done for a much different reason, but, but that was actually something that a therapist showed me my, like who I saw, um, not a colleague or anything <laughs> showed me and it, and it stuck with me and I've used it ever since. So I wanted to create something that I can share with other people and, uh, and some labels for those different concentric circles. So, uh, yeah, anyway, it just, it's so funny that I, I saw you posted that the very next day after I spent hours working on this thing. The Stoics have already done it, I guess. It's like when people say the Simpsons have done it, <laughs> when Family Guy tries to do it. Oh, we'll just I- say the Stoics have done it. The last conversation we had when you were on the podcast, I loved, you told me a lot about your life and sort of how you became who you are and things you went through in your childhood. And, um, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about is as, as a male and, you know, I look at 
emotions in our society as um, I, I the way I see it is that men or it, it's acceptable for men to experience and express a very limited range of emotions. And it's actually pretty limited for women too, but it's a much broader range than it is for men. And I know for me, and I've read a lot about, about this, uh, you know, at some point in our boyhood, we kind of get the message that we're not supposed to feel. We need to turn the volume down. We need to, we need to like disengage from our emotions and definitely not show it pretty much unless it's anger or maybe if we're uh, taking part in a sporting event or something like that, then it's okay. But I wondered what you would have to say about your experience with that. What were the kinds of messages you got? When did that sort of switch get flipped for you from when you're a little boy and pretty much however you feel, whatever emotion you show is acceptable to, okay, now I'm, you know, getting a little older. I'm a male. I'm not supposed to do that. Well, well, I don't know. I, I, I know you want me to have a good answer for this, but I don't know that I do because as I mentioned at the very outset, or at least I think I, I mentioned it briefly, I have ADHD. So me not expressing my emotions <laughs> has never been something that I've felt compelled not to do or been told not to do. And I've, I've also been, and I think that this comes hand in hand sometimes with ADHD, at least it does in, in my personal experience with it. I do not take, or I did not when I was a kid, I did not take kindly to people telling me what I could and couldn't do. <laughs> right. So if somebody told me I couldn't be mad about something, I'd say, well, that's nice. There's an opinion. Thanks for having it. I'm still going to be angry. Uh, and if I'm going to be excited or goofy, then that's what I'm going to be. So uh, I, I don't know that I ever had that. Now, I have a couple of, uh, I think, fortunate things that maybe made that the case. ADHD, I guess I'm looking at it as, now I'm looking at ADHD as a preferred indifferent. Right, right. But also, my family was not religious, so we didn't go to church, although I did, for some reason, spend a couple weekends in a Sunday school, which is vague to me. I remembered it as I was giving an interview earlier this week, and I can't explain why I was there. And I was also in a church play, but we never went to church. So I think it was just that we were from a very small town, and when a church play happened, they needed people right. <laughs> playing it, regardless of whether or not they went to church. Uh, but I didn't have religious parents. I didn't have religious grandparents. Um, everybody was, I, I wouldn't say an atheist. I, I would just say they were not preachy. I think my father probably, or my grandfather probably believed in a higher power. He was born in 1912. So it's likely that he did. Uh, my, my father's born in 1944. So he probably has a view of, you know, higher purpose and such that it isn't the typical millennial view, I guess I would say, cause I'm a millennial. Um, but I, I never had anybody tell me I couldn't feel a certain way. And if they, and if they did, I don't know that it would have made a difference for me in particular. So, but I do know what you're talking about, uh, because we have a lot of people in our discord community who I think there's like 600 people in there now. And often something that comes up is, you know, I have these feelings and emotions that like uh, someone joined from Pakistan the other day and people are in that server from all over the world. I think we've got like 80 countries represented so far. And they, they'll say things like, I feel this way, but if I, if I say I feel this way, I'm going to get in trouble. Or if I say I feel this way, then I won't be viewed as feminine in nature. And I am supposed to be because I'm a woman or I won't be viewed as masculine in nature. And I'm supposed to be because I'm a man. And I can only sympathize. I don't have an, an ability to empathize with that situation because I haven't been through it, but I can sympathize with it and just say that the, the Stoics would probably advise that, that we, we look at how our society views us, how our parents view us, how our friends might not be our friends anymore when compared to virtue as being an indifferent. Now, navigating that and incorporating it is easier said than done, right? And that's probably why I stick to the 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 writing and the teaching and the talking about stoicism in the sense that I'm talking about it now, rather than being a 
a life coach or, or a stoic mentor, like my, my mentor Kai Whiting is, because I, I'm not at the level of my understanding or implementation of stoicism to guide another person in doing that yet. But I bet if I, if I could refer him as a guest, I could have uh, Kai Whiting come onto your show and he would absolutely be able to answer that question. And he uh, is actually fairly, uh, he's, he's fairly big on one of the reasons that he, he joined me in what I'm doing at Practical Philosophy and Practical Stoicism is because 90% of our audience is men between the ages of 17 and 30. And as you said at the outset, that demographic of men, regardless of where in the world they live right now, they're suffering from a kind of identity crisis, which is hard to talk about because people are like, oh, yeah, white men have it real hard right, right. now. It's, it's hard to feel that way. But the truth is that white men, mostly through the subjugation of women, at least in, in the West, have always had a role uh, that women needed them. And that was, you know, that was because we wouldn't let women do anything. <laughs> right. That wasn't good. Uh, but it is the way that generations of men kind of built their identity. And that's not there anymore. And we can't pretend that that doesn't put us in a situation where we have to redefine what a man is supposed to be. So, so Kai is really passionate about this. I'm, I'm more so just kind of working through thinking about it because I see it as an issue, but I don't exactly know how to uh, instill a whole new way of identifying yourself as a man to an entirely new generation. But it is partly what I am trying to do with the show is at least prevent the people who find our content from, we see them, we see ourselves as getting in the middle of them and like Andrew Tate, then we will have done something good. Um, so we don't have a grand scheme or a grand plan yet, but we do recognize that that direction is probably not the direction we want men to go in while they're trying to figure out what, what they're to base their identity off of now. Um, but we know it's not supposed to be that way. And so we're, we're hoping that this talk about stoicism and virtue ethics and role-based ethics, um, which again, we can talk about if you'd like, that we think that that's going to do something to be useful. It's not who you're married to. It's not who you protect. It's not you identify yourself and your value based on your character, based on who you are. That's what you should be doing. That's, that's what matters. And it goes for women as well. I just think that at the moment, women are experiencing this. I'm not a woman, obviously, so, so I'm, I guess I'm extrapolating from experiences here. <laughs> um, but women are experiencing this huge, like this great thing, this big change that's good for them because they're like, oh, now I can work anywhere I want. And now I can make the same amount of money almost. And now I can you know, have almost any job I want. And that's like, they're like, yes, this is like a field day. This is awesome. <laughs> All the things that we haven't been able to do, we can now do. And men are like, well, but, but, but we were supposed to do those things for you. And, and now what do we do? And that's kind of a silly thing to talk about because again, it's like eye rolling, but they are still asking those questions like, oh, oh, what, what do I do now? Because they've been trained and set up to think that that's what they're supposed to do. We, we have to fix that. We have to teach them to base their identity off of something else. Yeah. Well, and you know, what you're talking about and, and, you know, guys that age are lost. I mean, I was pretty lost at that age, but not as lost as the guys emerging adults who I am exposed to now. I mean, a lot of them, you know, and really what it boils down to, if they live in a good functional family where someone is showing them love all the time and they're involved in the community, then, you know, they do okay. But if they don't have all those things, you see a lot of anxiety, a lot of just lack of direction. And, you know, I know guys who won't leave their bedroom except for to eat and go to the bathroom. And, and it's not because they're not smart and it's not because they don't have any people skills. It's because they're lost. And, um, and, you know, guys need something to believe in, you know? So it's great that you're doing this. It really is. I appreciate it. Um, because these guys, they're finding people on social media like Andrew Tate. And, you know, the thing that I see about Andrew Tate, um, is all the people who sort of, um, 
have come in his wake and who have sought to reinforce the messages that you hear from him, which, you know, they're not all terrible. Some would take good care of yourself, take responsibility for yourself, all those kinds of things. But then it gets really, really bad. You know, it gets into the misogyny and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, in, in indifference with a CE, right? Like, um, you know, I'm going to take what I can get and screw everybody else is kind of the vibe that comes from it. All those people are the ones who I hear talking about stoicism. They're not talking about real stoicism. They're, they're talking about lowercase stoicism as if it's as virtuous as capital S stoicism. I don't even think they know. So I, I rag on Ryan Holiday about this. Now, is he the guy who wrote the Daily Stoic? Yeah, he writes, he hosts the Daily Stoic podcast. He wrote the, uh, the, the, Stoic, the Daily Dad, I think, as well, which is like fatherhood advice from a Stoic perspective. But it's not, it's not really. Uh, and an example of that is if you read, gosh, what was his breakout book? It was uh, The Obstacle is the Way. And the obstacle is, is the way it doesn't use the word virtue a single time in 350 pages or so, not once. So if virtue, I mean, that would be like writing a book about Christianity and not talking about Jesus. It's, it's, it is the heart of the philosophy as Jesus is the heart of Christianity. Um, so it's very odd. But, but Ryan does less harm than most people do, in my, in my opinion. I don't know Ryan. We've never spoken. I'm, you know, I say these things publicly. I'm, I don't worry if he hears them because I think he probably agrees with me. Uh, the New York Times did a piece about him, I don't know, five years ago that said something like, Ryan Holiday sells stoicism as life hack without apology. And that's exactly what he does. And I don't think Ryan Holiday is the problem, to be honest. Um, people who come into contact with Holiday usually come into contact with better stoicism authors after that. So he's kind of like a gateway. And that's good. Um, so he serves a purpose in that way. And maybe we should you know, we shouldn't beat up on him. Um, but there is this kind of thing in the stoic community where we were like, Oh, who's your favorite stoic author? And someone who's new will say, Ryan Holiday. I will say, Oh Jesus, we've got, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, but that's okay. Like I said, he, he might, he might be playing an important role. Maybe he's, maybe he's the front door to this kind of resurgence of interest that, that we've been seeing. And he's nothing like Andrew Tate is. I mean, I, I want to make that very clear. Yeah. Well, I follow him and, you know, I see stuff that he posts and, Find value in it, you know? I mean, you can at least find value in it. Where, um, you know, a lot of what you see out there in, uh, on social media, it, it's, you know, I don't find value in it. It's just a way for people to uh, excuse themselves for being an asshole. You know, that's kind of, you know, and, and, uh, you know, the thing about emotions is that if you don't experience them, they're not going away. And, and what I heard you talk about, um, what I heard you explain the way I would explain it is, you know, aside from the instinctive stuff where you have a reaction, uh, because it's scary, those sorts of emotions, shock, aside from all that, there's a need to compartmentalize emotions when in the, the analogy that I've used is, you know, if, if you're the caveman trying to uh, kill the saber tooth tiger, you can't be stuck in fear. You know, you gotta, you gotta kill, you know, you gotta compartmentalize it and go home and back to the cave. And man, that was really, really scary, but I did it, you know, but, um, and it's, a. Uh, you know, a conversation I had with my son when he was little, uh, a number of years ago, because something would happen around the house, he'd get upset and, and he would kind of melt in tears. And, and this happened a few times and, you know, I'm not the dad who tells him he can never cry or anything like that. But my question for him was, who do you want to be? You know, do you want to be the, the person who, is useless in situations, you know, do you want to be the one who panics or do you want to be the person who can show up and help out and be of service to help the people you love in those situations? You know, it's okay to be upset, but you don't have to 
you know, you don't have to melt down so that you're no good to anybody. And I think one of the real problems in as we relate to emotions as a society is we look at it in a very black and white way. Either you're lowercase s stoic, right? Or you're a mess. And, uh, you know, so either you're going to melt down and be emotional. We use it almost like it's a four letter word or something. Um, <laughs> yes. Right. Block it off. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but there's no, um, we don't think of it as if there's somewhere in the middle, like I can walk in strength and be sad at the same time and show emotion, show sadness at the same time. It's not one or the other. There's a gray area and really, um, you know, I think what I hear in the place that you don't like the name of that I mentioned earlier that I won't use again online. Um, is, you can, you can say it just cause I feel like people will be lost. Okay. Manosphere. Yeah. It's been a while. The manosphere is, you know, that's where I hear all about, you know, you, you need to be stoic, not emotional. That's what, and, and the next thing out of their mouths is invariably that would make you feminine. And this whole idea that uh, emotions are feminine or masculine, we just made it up. It's just something we say. There's really no truth to it. It's just that we repress. We're as men, we're boys, we're socialized to repress our emotions. So we're not as emotionally literate. We don't, you know. It, it, but that's not because we're men. It's because how we deal with emotions as a culture, it's not because women are more emotional. It's because we're stuck, you know? And I think to me, that's as much a reason why young men are lost as anything else. And, uh, and this is all really personal to me because, you know, I had a really tough time as an emerging adult, almost drank myself to death. You know, because there was nobody there who could teach me how to navigate my emotional world. There was nobody showing me, teaching me how to do it. And and furthermore, I felt shame because I was sad and I felt lost. All those things. I thought there was something wrong with me because I felt that way. Um, but I've had... You know, as a, as a late teen and young adult, a number of friends commit suicide and they were all going through just pretty normal stuff. They got in trouble at school, like big trouble at school. It was big, but you know, and, or, you know, fell in love with a girl and she dumped him and, you know, went with another guy, those kinds of things where, you know, I mean, somebody's blowing their brains out over something like that because they don't understand that it's okay to talk to somebody. They don't have anybody who can sit with them and hear them, you know? So I just, you know, I think especially as guys, we need each other. We need to be able to talk to each other. We need to be able to talk to each other with some degree of intimacy, which meaning, you know, I can tell you I'm sad. Or I can tell you I'm hurt or whatever it is and, and, uh, have that be an acceptable line of conversation to have. But the problem is that what happens most of the time is if, if I'm upset and I show that to you and you're not the least bit emotionally literate, then you're going to get triggered. You're going to feel upset and you're going to want to get me to feel better rather than actually you know, engage. So anyway, I kind of went off on a tangent there. Well, th this is actually a, a relatively decent segue into uh, the concept of role ethics because you were talking about your son and what he wanted to be. So I, I do want to talk about role ethics a little bit, but I want to point out before why prioritizing virtue is the only good is such a mind shift uh, and, and such a, and such a good one and helpful for like all the, all the things you just talked about because if your credo becomes 
virtue is the only good, then that means that every action you take and every thought you have, it's based around the question, is this what someone with a virtuous character would do? Or does this external thing which has happened to me have any impact on the thing I perceive to be the only good, the virtuousness or lack thereof of my character? And that means that you can, you can literally filter everything through that question. And as you become more adept at doing that, things like, well, my girlfriend left me or my boyfriend left me, become questions of, well, what does that have to do with my ability to do the only good thing that is the entire focus of my life? And when I said that at the very outset, when I said that Stoicism doesn't rise to the definition of a religion in contemporary senses, it does have a very spiritual, very religiosityness to it because of in the same way that when someone in uh, Abrahamic religions accepts a savior and everything becomes about praying and service to the savior, that, that, that it makes everything else not matter. You've probably noticed, no doubt, that people who are extremely devout people seem to also be, for some reason, very happy people. And I, and I think that that's pr- because they have shifted their mind about what is truly the most important thing. Now, they say the most important thing is God. I'll leave that to them. I'm still an atheist. Um, but to me, virtue is the only good. And that means that anything that happens to me, any external, if my if my partner leaves me tomorrow, if my dog dies, it doesn't mean I don't feel emotion. It means I can feel the emotion just fine because there's nothing wrong with being sad. The stoic can cry. The stoic can feel joy. So can the sage. All that's fine. But we get to pass it through the filter of, does this impact the only reason I'm here? to become a good person, to build a virtuous character. It probably takes time to make that shift. I'm not there yet, right? I don't want to make it sound as as though I am, but I'm better at it now. And it means that when, and I think you and I, Tom, have talked in the past about some of the really unfortunate things that have happened in my past. I am better at surviving those things now than I've ever been. And it, and it is because I get to pass them through that filter. And when we are thinking about our own actions and what we will do and what we should do, I can talk about role ethics now. Uh, stoicism is virtue ethics. It's also role ethics. So roles are things that can be, they can be your preferences. So for example, you could say, well, I want to be a nurse. I want to be a firefighter. They can be your personal preference, right? And then there are roles that are assigned to you through your actions. So let's say you have an intimate relationship and someone gets pregnant and now you are a mother or a father. That is a role as well. Uh, And then there are roles assigned by your government. Maybe you're a taxpayer, a role assigned by your employer. Maybe you're a fry cook like SpongeBob SquarePants. And in Stoicism, we say one one of the ways that you know what you're supposed to do, how to set that filter up, is what do your roles ask of you? If you're a fry cook, how do you be an excellent fry cook? Because the virtuous thing to do in regards to that role is to be the best fry cook you can be. Well, what does that mean? Show up on time. Do your absolute best. And it gives you some direction. We were talking about direction earlier. It gives you some direction in identifying what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to be doing it. Are you a father? Okay, well, what is expected of you as a father or a mother? And you can answer those questions because those questions are fairly obvious most of the time. And when the question is confusing, like there maybe your son or daughter has come out to you and this is not an experience you've had before and you're not exactly sure what exactly you're supposed to do in that situation, you can say, well, what is an appropriate and approaching virtue action that I can take right now? What would someone with a golden virtuous character do? Would they get mad? Probably not. Would they, and I don't know exactly what they do, but I'm pretty sure they wouldn't get mad. I think it's more like they'd be supportive or they'd try to understand or they'd try to not make their son or daughter feel uncomfortable or scared or hated, right? At least we can figure these things out. And so role ethics are a way of identifying what your job is, so to speak. And then if you pass everything through that, what would a virtuous person do? You can pretty easily answer at least what they wouldn't do. And that can be helpful to, to having some of these emotions, being able to assent to ones properly so that you can feel sadness when it's appropriate, and being able to let go of the ones that have nothing to do with your ability to build virtue, to, to build a better character, so you can just let them go. And it's not a repression. It's a, oh, it actually doesn't matter because it doesn't have an impact on the thing that I'm, that I'm motivated to do with my life.
I write almost daily on Substack and I have a podcast that's daily on wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, I also have a discord community. It's got, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 countries represented in it, about 600 people in total so far as of today. And it's a place where we dive into discussions on stoic theory. We can go deep uh, or it's just a place for people to get together and ask each other questions or share funny memes that have to do with stoicism. It's just a place for people to come and know that the other people there are interested in this thing too. Uh, and it's a nice place. I guess we could say it's a, it's a safe place for Stoics who want to talk about Stoicism. And all of those things can be found at stoicismpod.com. And there's just a bunch of links there, you know, like a link tree or something like that. So it's easy to find all those things. But, but if you're interested in learning more about Stoicism, I, I write on Substack for free. We talk about it in the Discord all the time. We talk about it on the podcast uh, every week. On Mondays, we talk about uh, Marcus Aurelius. On Tuesdays, we cover one of Seneca's moral letters to Lucilius. On Wednesdays, we do an interview. If we have one, we can't always find them. On Thursday, uh, we do a fireside chat. On Friday, we do a listener mailbag, which is absolutely getting out of hand at this point because too many people ask questions, uh, but we're trying to keep up with it. And then on Saturday, we do a, a segment called Practical Buddhism, which is hosted by Emma Varva Lucas of the Progress Network because there are parallels, plenty of uh, not parallels, but the opposite of, of that is <laughs> plenty of not parallels in Buddhism and Stoicism, but there are some parallels that are worth exploring and they're interesting. And Emma takes us through that. And then uh, on Sundays, Eric DeMott hosts um, Practical Cynicism, which is cynicism is in a serious way, a precursor to Stoicism. And this is capital C cynicism. And if you think there are misconceptions about Stoicism, there are even more probably about cynicism. Um, but cynicism is the school under, so I'm using, putting air quotes for school, but the school under which Zeno, the founder of Stoicism in 300 BCE, studied and under, studied under uh, Crates the Cynic. And so cynicism informed, helped to inform uh, Stoicism. So there's a rich history there that predates Stoicism. It's interesting to some people. So yeah, content every, uh, every day of the week on the podcast. And I publish multiple articles a week. We're onboarding more academics. For example, William O. Stevens of Creighton University, uh, he's Professor Professor Emeritus of Philosophy, I think. And geez, are we up to anything else? We've got the book coming out, and um, we're always in the Discord. So we'd, we'd love to have people join and have conversations there. I appreciate taking the time to do all this. I, I always enjoy talking to you. I mean, you're just such a classy dude. You really, really are. And, uh, and you know, I think you're probably closer to living this than what you think based on what I see of how you show up in the world. And, you know, there are a lot of things you talked about that, that I've, you know, been taught too. you know, um, if, if you, if what you want to do is flip burgers, make sure you flip the best hamburger you possibly can. And, uh, and I don't always live up to that sort of standard the way that I probably should, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, at this point in my life, I just turned 50. I mean, I really have to want to do something to give it a hundred percent. You know, it's not like when I was in my twenties when I would give a hundred percent to whatever job I had. Now I have to, my heart's got to be in it. And then I go full tilt, you know, uh, but we really do need to be grounded in some sort of belief system in life. And this is the type of thing that people can really sink their teeth into. And it doesn't matter if they're religious or not. It's it it can help anyone. I actually should say something about that because you're right. And pe people may get the misconception that there is a stoic God. Um, but the sto the thing that, the thing that really differentiates stoicism from Aristotelianism, for example, or uh, other isms of the time uh, is the claim that virtue is the only good. So technically the only thing you need to accept in order to practice quote unquote, capital S stoicism is that virtue is the only good. Now there is a little bit of cognitive dissonance that happens if you decide not to believe in the stoic concept of God, which is, which is basically the universe is its own kind of animal. And we are like appendages of that universe. So it's a very 
not contemporary Abrahamic view of God. Like I say, I'm an atheist. I am. What's the word they use for it? Is it logos? Yeah, yeah, they say lo- well. Logos is the is what they refer to as the divine creative fire, uh, but the God itself is is all of it, the the logos and the pneuma. And there's another one that I can't remember, but it's all wrapped up inside of the universe is essentially the God. So there is a again, I call myself an atheist, and I I accept the Stoic idea of God because it doesn't violate what I've come to identify as being atheism. Um, so when people ask me if I'm an atheist, I say yes. And they ask if I believe in the Stoic God, I say yes. And they say, how is that possible? <laughs> and I say, because the God isn't what, that term doesn't mean what you think it does when you go back to 300 BCE, right? It's to- totally different. So you don't have to believe in the Stoic God in order to practice capital S Stoicism. But because the logic and the and the ethics and, and the physics are based off of their reasoning realm, I should say that the ethics is, as A.A. Long says, parasitical on the physics, on the cosmology. There is a little bit of cognitive dissonance that arises, but in a, in a contemporary sense, it probably doesn't actually matter. It would be the difference between a, a let's say, a practicing Christian in contemporary times and a priest in contemporary times. The priest gets it more than you do, but that doesn't mean you're not a Christian, right? It's kind of kind of the same, I think. Well, I've probably taken up enough of your time. I really appreciate you doing this, man. It's been a it's been a treat to talk to you again and I'm gonna keep following what you're doing. I can't wait for the book to come out. And uh you'll have to come back sometime. And I definitely do if you could uh share with me the way to reach out to your uh co author. I'd love to have him on as well. That'd be great. Oh, he would love that. I will get you that information for sure. to the show please subscribe leave a rating or a review at apple podcasts or wherever you listen you can learn more about my other podcasts by visiting the path to authenticity.com or by clicking the link in the show notes the music is by the band punk rock opera used under a creative commons license and with permission from the artist. The show is produced by me, Tom Gentry. You can find more of my work on Substack, including a podcast only available to paid subscribers. So again, thanks for listening. Keep coming back. Be nice.
did great, honey. 